Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Monday, July 25th. Derek Van Riper here with half marathon finisher, Eno Saris. You know how you're oh. feeling today? Oh, I got hardware. Yeah, oh, baby. There you go. Yeah, there you baby. Go. I told my kids this was because I got first place. <laughs> do you think they're, do they believe that even now or will they soon uh, find out that's not the case? No, then I told them I was just kidding. Um, I, I did finish above the 50th percentile for men so there's that so slightly uh, red dot on your stat cast half yes, marathon my, my slider finish. my my got that dog in him slider has passed 50 <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm sore in places i really didn't expect to be sore uh, i i I also uh, apologize to anybody in the last sort of mile and a half of the race. I was not yelling at you. I was yelling at me. Uh, <laughs> I was yelling words of encouragement at myself. Things like only a mile left. Come on, let's go. Let's let's <laughs> F and go. And I hope that anybody that was uh, sort of finishing with a walk or, or uh, going slower than me at that point was not like ah, this a-hole. <laughs> that was me just trying to fire myself up for the last stretch, which I miss. I miss red. So I had I had a one last stretch where I sprinted past uh, the ballpark and sprint is in relative terms here. And then uh, and then I realized, oh, no, there's another sort of three tenths of a mile to go. Uh, so I just sort of limped my way <laughs> through that last bit, but, uh, I don't know what to do next. You know, like, uh, I did, I, it was kind of cool to like get, uh, get something. I think that sometimes you hear it from people that, you know, win an award or yeah, you know, win a Cy Young or something and, you know, or, or just like have some sort of accolades where they're like, you know, they, they say they don't know what to say about it. It's I, I didn't do anything like huge, but I did do something that I set out to do. And so now it's like, what's next? Like, you know, and a lot of, I think athletes are just so wired. They're like another one, you know, I'm going to better next one. time. Go faster. Yeah. Go yeah. further. <laughs> Dude, so I guess, I guess that's the answer is try to beat my time next year. Uh, I don't want to think about that right now, though. So I, I just I hurt too much. <laughs> yeah, enjoy the soreness for a week, and then you know think about what's next. I, I don't know. Get into weightlifting. You could do a weightlifting competition. No, that's no? for that's that's for Brit. Well, yeah, that's true. That is her. <laughs> that is her area of expertise uh, on this uh, on this show. But pickleball championship, pickleball championship. We could try that. We uh, we lost beat, a very casual Jeremy match. Lynch. <laughs> beat Jeremy Lin. <laughs> That's going to be our, my next goal. There you beat go. Beat Jeremy Lin in pickleball. <laughs> All right. That's a noble goal. I think I can get on board with You're that. You're my trainer for that one. Well, we may have to play doubles. So who, if it's you and I playing Jeremy Lin and someone, who do you want that someone to be? Someone who's a lot worse than Jeremy Lin. I'm just assuming that a former NBA player is pretty good at pickleball. <laughs> He's probably not slow. And, you know, with NBA limbs, probably has pretty good court coverage. So, yeah, I would say we need something good very touch. bad to play with <laughs> <Yeah>. him. <laughs> like his mom or something? <laughs> no, nah, she's probably good. Like, you know, she birthed him, right? <laughs> if it had to be someone who played in the NBA, I'm going to go back another era and say Kurt Rambis. I want us to beat Jeremy <laughs> Lin and Kurt Rambis in pickleball. That is my new goal. Uh, if you had somebody like Boban, who's like, you know, like seven feet <laughs> eight or something you could just maybe just aim at his kneecaps all the time <laughs> it's true you could try yeah so <laughs> new goals in mind here on rates and barrels on this episode we're going to dig into the stat cast bat tracking piece that mike petriello wrote a couple weeks ago you know mentioned it kind of in passing last week i figured it was worth bringing up again with a little bit more detail as far as what we're hoping to learn from it in the short term and what we're really hoping that the tool can offer us in the long run, especially we'll talk about a few struggling starting pitchers. We'll take a look at the pitching plus model against some results, looking for some surprises really on both ends. And I think it's about time for prospect of the week, which is kind of a prospect of the, whenever we feel like talking about a prospect segment it doesn't <laughs> roll off the tongue quite as well, but uh, we will talk a little bit about a couple prospects that we like later on in the show. Let's begin with the StatCast bat tracking, and I will try to put a link to the piece in the show description, as I occasionally do. That way, if you have not read it, or if you want to read it again, you can refer back to it very easily. 
Uh, but we have some tracking of what's happening with swings in two ballparks. It's from Dodger Stadium and Minute Maid Park in Houston. And it started back in mid-May at the time the article was written. I think the data stopped July 10th. So it's a simple question to start. Like, what, what could we hope to learn from knowing how fast players are swinging the bat and having more detailed information about the quality of swings and the types of swings that players have? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole thing was that before we had uh, we had a radar technology that couldn't tell the difference between a bat and the end of your arm, you know. So there wasn't uh, that ability to separate out limbs and separate out the bat. Now that we can do that with thanks to Hawkeye, um, I think there's also all sorts of stuff we can say. The beginning of what we're saying now and what uh, Mike Petriello has, has released in this piece is just how fast the bat is going. But they did, they touch on a little bit where they talk about, you know, also where on the, like physically where on the bat would the, the, the contact occur. And so there is that whole idea of sweet spot. The sweet spot that you see on StatCast is more of a reverse engineered, like sort of, did they hit it flush because of what the results look like? Not did they actually hit it in the sweet spot of the bat? And I think in the future, we'll have more of a true sweet spot, which is like, did they actually hit it in the right spot on the bat? Because these things are important because, you know, there's a couple guys on there. The uh, Marlins catcher, Nick Fortes, Mm -hmm. uh, he has some really good bat speed numbers, but not any good exit velo or max exit velo type numbers. Um, Some of the... uh, what you can surmise is perhaps that he's not squaring the ball up very well. Um, and uh, so, you know, a barrel obviously is a combination of bat speed and um, anticipation, bat control, you know, whatever it is, hitting it flush. You could, like we all, we've known for a while, you know, Cabrian Hayes hits the ball really hard, so he must have pretty good bat speed. The question is, can he change his bat angle can he change his approach in order to make the most out of the bat speed i think that we've been looking at these sort of things through max exavilo as a way of sort of that that guy must have pretty good bat speed when he has his a swing going because he can hit 120 or 115 uh but this is now more directly measuring that and then we can sort of suss through is it uh, approach is it uh, having and having three different swings and going to the b and c swing a lot um you know, or is it just not, not hitting the ball flush? I think the, I think this early thing is really fun. Um, You know, one thing to, to remember, even on the bat speed one, the, the, the top of the list, they were, they were putting this uh, in Houston and LA. So all the people that you see on this list that are not playing for Houston and LA probably had a, a very few swings. And they, if you read the sort of small type, um, minimum three batted ball contacts. So mm-hmm. uh, they basically, you know, Julio Rodriguez has a 96 mile an hour bat speed and he's at number top, the top of this list. It was on three swings, you know, who knows um, what it looks like when you start factoring a swing, B swing, C swing, miss hits, things like that. Although we did see at the, at the home run derby that he had a uh, pretty sweet uh, bat speed, but otherwise you got Luis Robert as second, and I think that's a really good um, sign that you know he the the questions for him are not about power; they're about making contact um, and having the right approach and squaring it up. I've seen some sort of buy lows in fantasy, um, and I say buy low sort of loosely. This is a guy who could be a Mike Trout type player. You know, this is a guy who could go thirty thirty. Uh, with the, I don't know if you do 330 30, but like 30 30 with a pretty good batting average. So, if you are looking for like a rebuild situation, where you're like, I want to throw everything I have and get one player, he's he's like high on that list, I would say. And I think this is this is a good Giancarlo Stanton being third, duh. Uh, Fran Mil Reyes being fourth, I think, is like a good example of well, what about all the other stuff. <laughs> right, because well, I, I think the the raw swing speed leaderboard is going to be similar in function to what we use max exit velocity for now. Right? Okay, at, 
when you swing the bat as hard as you can, you swing the bat harder than most people. That gives us an idea of your raw power potential. If you are going to swing and miss often, that doesn't help you as much. You you would benefit from having more barrel control. And I think we're going to get to the point where once we're seeing where precisely guys are hitting hitting the ball with the bat, we're going to see who has better barrel control. I think we're going to be able to quantify hit tool in ways that we couldn't before. Yes. Whereas now, now I think yeah. we're quantifying hit tool a lot of times looking at low strikeout Swing rates, different strike things you rate. do around the zone. Yeah, This will, I think, really unlock a lot of, of possible answers that we've been wondering about for a long time. And what are the real differences in players that have an average hit tool, an above average hit tool, a well above average hit tool, and an excellent hit tool? Like which, Defining that with more precision, I think, will be really good. And which things are more important, right? And which things are more trainable? Uh, wh- who, what types of... do Are there players that do... Uh, like Nick Fortes, are there a lot of Nick Forteses out there that have great bat speed that do figure out how to put the barrel on the ball better? Or are there more uh, guys that put the barrel, uh, th- that hit on the sweet spot a lot uh, that can maybe use uh, weighted bat training to up their bat swing, their, their, their swing speed? Um, so which which was the place that we want to look more often? In fact, this might not be the best place for us to look uh, for breakouts, uh, because maybe it's just not that often that someone cuts their strikeout rate by a lot, you know, just to make it simple. Like, you know, it's nice that Fernando Reyes swings the bat really hard, but how likely is it that he gets that strikeout rate under 30% again? Uh, Jesus Sanchez is high on this list. Um, he has the same sort of issues. In fact, what we may be wanting to look for is guys who have a really high sweet spot percentage. Uh, and I'm talking about the real one um, that uh, could benefit from some weighted bat training in the off speed in the off season. It's the same question I think as sort of uh, do I want a guy with great velocity who can't find the zone or maybe doesn't have great shape on his fastball, or do I want a guy who has great shapes and and may be able to add a couple ticks? Um, I think I know where I stand on that for pitchers. I think I would rather find a guy with a lot of pitches and some command that was young in the minor leagues and could add a couple of ticks. I'm thinking sort of Kirby-esque, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I like that uh, profile a little better than, I'm trying to think, maybe like Carlos Hernandez, who had good velo and some good secondaries, but just awful command. Yeah. Um, These are just two examples, two archetypes, and of course they serve my purpose in telling the story, <laughs> but uh, these are things that you can study better. Um, I, I think it's a, a couple of things are interesting. Rodolfo Castro uh, is on this list. MJ Melendez. Uh, those are some uh, sort of, uh, you know, I think in Rodolfo Castro's case, if you're in a deep dynasty, maybe you just find a place for him on your roster based on this little tidbit. I mean, we're all looking for breakouts and breakouts come from all different directions and if you have an extra roster space and you're just playing around with it, you know, I like Rodolfo Castro's body. He's got like this kind of fire plug, you know, he's really strong, really kind of compact. Um, and he has the same question as a lot of other guys is, can you make more contact? And maybe an additional one of sort of where you're going to play defensively. But there is a possibility there's he's a, he's the second baseman. And I know that there were people around the team last year that thought he would be the second baseman of the future there. So it's a, a guy to keep an eye on. I'll cheat to answer your hitter related question. Assuming that there's enough raw bat speed to catch up to big league fastballs generally, right? There's a certain point where you just don't swing the bat fast enough to be a big league hitter. Like assuming you have that threshold met, I would rather have the player with the great barrel control who needs to add a little more bat speed because I think that can be a function of strength and probably some mechanical adjustments. Whereas I think the the barrel control, I think that's a uh, I think that's a harder skill to hone in on. I don't think this is a case where you can't learn it. I just think it's harder to learn. I think I feel like feats of brute strength are easier to go train for. Feats of a very precise athletic ability, that yeah. hand eye coordination, that I think is a lot more difficult to teach people 
at this sort of level. So at, it's the same kind of answer as the pitching question. Like I think it, it, it I'd, I'd rather have the the great barrel control first and then add power. I'd, I'd rather have the finesse if I could only have one of those things be above average and I'll, I'll try and make the power above average with training and heavier bats and different things like that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there's a kind of a, a different organizational approach here. I think that's, sh- that's peeking out from underneath the numbers, the Astros and the Dodgers, they had, they, they had the setup in their parks. So their numbers are the most robust. And if you look at their regulars so that you can kind of look away from the guys who maybe, cause they still have a minimum three batter cup ball contacts. But if you look to their regulars, you'll, you'll, you'll have more than three. Um, and so the Astros, Jordan Alvarez, you know, he's on the top 10 leaderboard. Uh, he's got nearly 90 mile an hour bat speed average is around 80. So, uh, he's good. Kyle Tucker, 84, Alex Bregman, 82, um, you know, even Martin Maldonado, 81, Jeremy Pena, just up 80. Um, and they're only real. Uh, regular players that are below average bat speed are Jose Altuve at 78. I just think leverages uh, all of his body and and picks pitches pretty well. Uh, Jake Myers, I guess, but there's an injury question there, you know, just coming off the shoulder issue. And then Michael Brantley, 76, who has probably one of those finesse type, you know, profiles where he can really put the sweet spot on the ball a lot. Now, you flip over to the Dodgers and it looks very, very different. You're going to ignore the, the top three guys in bat speed are, are not regulars on that team. So the number one regular on the bats uh, in bat speed uh, is Max Muncy, who is a surprise to us all, I think, given his injury history. And he's got about an 84. Mookie Betts is an 82. Chris Taylor an 81. And that's it. Those are the only guys on the Dodgers that have above average swing speeds. Um, you've got Lux pretty close at 79.6, Turner 79.5, Will Smith 79, Freddie Freeman 78.7, Cody Ballinger 78.4, Justin Turner 74.8. But I think that the Dodgers probably feel like if you have a good hit tool and a good approach at the plate and can swing the, the bat near 80 miles an hour, then we're happy with you. You know what I mean? Like you're probably going to do good stuff at the plate. Um, whereas uh, the Astros seem to put a little bit more priority on bat speed, more maybe they train for it or um, they've uh, they they scouted for it, picking these guys up because of those bat speeds, you know, in the minors. But um, I think there's a little bit of a different approach here. Yeah, really interesting stuff, and it'll be nice to get more uh, information, of course, having this in all parks eventually and, and getting the robust data set for every team as opposed to just the two teams that were at home and uh, the players that came through on the road. I think we'll make this uh, a lot more interesting in the years ahead, really. It's not, it's not really going to happen this year. There's also a really uh, cool little section about uh, about Pat Path um that you know uh w- that is related to and uh, we've had a couple people write in um that the sort of 50 percent fly ball rate um guys uh, you know there's been some research done and and uh sorry that i don't have the names right in front of me uh but i have shouted them out before but d- you know that there's research uh that shows that at 50 percent uh fly balls your batting average goes down however uh, that same research s- does not have as clear of a result when it comes to WOBA or OPS because what they're doing is replacing signals with homers, right? Um, but here in StatCast, what they did was not by fly ball rate, but by uppercut swing and flat swing. And the flat swing, uh, you know, had the best or at least second best batting averages, Um and, and, and part of what we might be missing is just the batting average. Babbitt batting average on balls and play does not include homers. So if you look at the uppercut swing, probably close to the 50% fly ball guys, if you do batting average on contact, they have a 348, and the flat guys have a 331. Um, if you look at batting average on balls and play, they have a 236 for right. the uppercut swing and a 326 for the flat swingers. 
So generally the uppercut swing is good, but I think if you start, all of these numbers are BA on contact and Woba on contact. And I think what you're missing with this is uh, strikeouts. Cause I think the uppercut swings are the easiest to strike out. So I like the sort of there's groups between uppercut and flat. And I like group two, the best, um, which is a slight uppercut. Um, and I think if you look across the numbers, there's a lot of uh, reason to like that, especially if you add strikeouts back in. And thanks to Ethan, one of our listeners, for sending us a really good email about the, the high fly ball race. We'll probably dissect that a bit in greater detail at some point in the near future. Let's move on to some pitching stuff. Uh, I was looking at some struggling starting pitchers this morning. You know, one in particular, I think I mentioned maybe, I don't know, two months ago or so. I, I bet against the model with uh, Ian Anderson in one league, and he is oh, no. still, still struggling. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, a bad, league. real bad one recently, too. Yeah, and I, it's that's that's kind of why I wanted to come back around to him. It's just like, okay, it's it's not getting better for Ian Anderson at this point. And the model appropriately warned me in this case. This was my own doing, but it's a low strikeout rate. It's a high walk rate. ERA for the season now well above five at 531. We've reached the point with Ian Anderson. There's no guarantee he stays in the Atlanta rotation. You know, the trade deadline could shake things up. They've got internal candidates that could probably push him. The bigger question that I think people would want to know for multi-year purposes or if you're a fan uh, in Atlanta, can Ian Anderson be fixed? Can you take some of the things he does and keep those things, then overhaul other parts of his pitch mix and his approach and get something back that resembles the successful pitcher he was prior to this season? I don't have any good news when it comes to uh, how he's looked over the course of the season. Uh, his peak stuff plus this year, uh, you know, came about a month ago around 89. Uh, and his nadir, uh, has come pretty, uh, come, came a couple starts before that at 73. So he's been hovering between poor to below, like really below average stuff. The location numbers, uh, kind of come and go, but are generally below average. Um, and then when I look over at uh, his his pitches, his curveball rates as his best pitch, and it's uh, 91, 92. Um, the four seam fastball, uh, he locates all right. Um, and then the changeup, you know, the model could be missing on the changeup, and uh, you know he does locate it fairly well. So I would be looking, I think, for either a cutter. Um, or uh, a velo jump or like a movement change on his four seam, which I, at this point in his career, I don't, I don't know how likely that is, but you could hear it in the spring. I just wouldn't want to trade for him now, hoping that next spring I hear that he's added a cutter or, you know, added two ticks. Yeah. It's a, it's a long way. I guess the, the reason for optimism, a reason for optimism is look at the transformation of Kyle Wright. Kyle Wright's two and a half years older. He picked up a couple of ticks and, and really just kind of came back a completely different pitcher this year in a lot of ways, right? Increased the curveball. It's a totally different pitch too, I think, by Velo. And even the movement seems like it's totally different with Kyle Wright. So maybe, maybe there's a blueprint there within the organization of, of someone that you could say, hey, look, we did this with right we can do something similar with ian anderson so i guess evidence is always nice we saw the evidence with kyle Wright pretty early on this season probably even in the spring if you were watching yeah. closely it's a little bit more likely it's a guy that i would jump on in the early season if his if his stuff numbers change radically you know <laughs> mm -hmm. then somebody i would i would bet on i mean the It'd be one thing if all of his location numbers were above 100 and he had three pitches, right? Because then you'd be like, okay, he could be like uh, a Tyler Anderson, right? That just uh, that makes a tiny tweak to his changeup and boom, uh, he has a Tyler Anderson as season. But he does not have good command. And we've, we've known that since the minor leagues. Yeah, that has been an ongoing concern for Ian Anderson. 
Let's get to Yusei Kikuchi. Goes to Toronto. <laughs> Another guy with no command. <laughs> no command. Career best strikeout rate so far this season. Career worst walk rate and a pretty bloated home run rate too. He actually was slightly worse in his debut season. You're the rabbit ball back in 2019 in Seattle, but within within arm's reach of the same terrible home run rate he had back then. When I see Kikuchi, when he's good, you watch him and you think, okay, there has to be another level here. At the very least, he should be the passable but below average ratios with a great strikeout rate sort of pitcher that on a good team often ends up being a net positive in value. Clearly, he's not doing that right now. Only three wins on the season. Unfortunately, we still care about wins. You say Kikuchi's not getting wins. He's not getting very deep into his starts very often. What's going wrong here? I mean, this is the team that helped really get Robbie Ray's career up to this new sort of level that I don't think anyone really expected. And I thought they could maybe work some similar magic with Kikuchi. And it just has not worked out so far for him in his first season with the Jays. There was some hope. Um, you know, he started out fairly well. And then, you know, there's a there's a three start stretch in early May uh, where he just it was very good. You know, 20 strikeouts in three in three starts with three earned runs and in, in like uh, 17 innings or something. So that was good. What uh, happened since then is that both numbers, his stuff and his location have fallen off. And his location was pretty pretty bland back then too. Some high 90s and some hundreds. One game, two games with 104, 103. That's right in the middle of that that good stretch. But his stuff has fallen off since then too. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, things just as basic as velocity. You know, he was pumping some high 94s and he had, he had to start with 96.1, some 95s. And then right before uh, he went on the IL, it was 93.7, 94.6, 94.7. Like, you know, there's something something there. I just think that th- he has adapted to the American style of pitching in the very worst way, which is <laughs> he's just throwing as hard as he can all the time. Uh, and that's made it's exacerbated his command issues. So I don't. Um, there's a little bit more hope, I guess, than the Ian Anderson profile, which is could he relax and not throw as hard sometimes and and get that strike, um, or could he just get back to at least he has a stretch this year where you're like that was good, do that what you were doing in early May, can you do that again? Uh, so. I think in uh, situations with like NFPC or, you know, in 12, I'm not sure about, but like 15 team leagues where uh, you see a good stretch coming up in terms of matchups, you know, he's coming up and, and you've got, you can actually play the schedule game. You're like, Ooh, I like this week or this week. Maybe he could be a cheap acquisition for you. It almost looks like he dusted off an old slider this year too if you look look at the numbers from 2019 in terms of the the vertical movement on that pitch the velo and you compare 19 and 22 they look really similar and then the two seasons between 2020 and 2021 look very different i wonder if there's anything going on there where maybe the command of that pitch just hasn't come back and that's part of the struggle i mean it clearly it seems like the Jays liked that slider better given the similarities and everything that they pushed him back in that direction. It just hasn't worked so far. Yeah. And the slider rates well. And in fact, uh, by, by the model locates it at average, it's his best pitch. Um, the four seamer, great stuff, really poor location. And that's, I think that's just what I've seen. I've seen him live. He, he came here uh, to Oakland. I think he was out in the second or third. Um, and he just couldn't locate the four seamer. And, you know, maybe if he throws the cutter and the slider, uh, but the, it says here that he can, he can locate the cutter worse. Mm. So he basically has one pitch he can command. So I don't know if he needs to take something off that four seamer so he can, he can put it somewhere where he wants it, but that's, it's all about four seam command for him, four seam locations, at least. Maybe if you can't change the, the command, maybe you can at least, have him aim somewhere differently. (laughs) 
slider results include a 322 batting average against and a 632 slugging percentage against. It just doesn't make sense for that pitch with that level of command. Shouldn't get hit as hard as you say Kikuchi has been hit to this point. How about Aaron Ashby? Kind of feels a little different than the other two, maybe because we haven't seen quite as much of him in the big leagues. I've just got an extension from the Brewers over the weekend. You know, team control was going to keep him in Milwaukee for a long time anyway, so it's not it's not that big of a commitment in the grand scheme of things. But to me, it's a signal that the Brewers are pretty optimistic that Ashby is going to keep getting better and especially better than he's been so far this season. A 457 ERA and a 149 whip through 69 innings. K's have been there, 83 strikeouts. You see a lot of red ink on the StatCast page, so it looks like there's a lot to like here. One thing I noticed, I was looking at the pitcher list page for Ashby before we started recording. Each of his four pitches had a CSW above 30% when I looked, and that seems pretty unusual for someone with an arsenal that deep to get called strikes and whiffs with everything in the arsenal. Yeah, I mean he's he's an absolute buy low. He's an absolute buy. I'm, uh, you know, if he's available wherever you know you ever wherever you play, I'd pick him up. I don't. Uh, he lights up any model you look at. You look at stuff plus. He's uh, the slider, the change up, the curveball, and sinker all above average. And the slider is standout pitch. The change up at one thirteen is actually for change ups. That's really good. Uh, and the sinker one oh four stuff plus sinker. That's hard to do. Uh, so, you know, his location numbers aren't great, but they aren't bad. You know, Kikuchi has a uh, location on the fastball of 90 and, and the spread in location plus is not large, you know, in terms of, you can see it. If you go on the spreadsheet, you know, and you look through it, you're talking about like 110 to 85 is like, <laughs> can, you know, has all of the guys. Um, whereas stuff plus has a, a larger range location plus is pretty, pretty tight. And, uh, so, you know, for a 90, uh, a 90 stuff plus, uh, as 90 location plus for Kikuchi on the fastball is really bad. Uh, Ashby, for example, on the sinker below average, but 98. So, you know, I think, uh, this is just a small sort of, uh, moment where he's got to figure out, you know, command is a relative term, what he can sort of put in decent places, what he can throw in the zone when he needs to, uh, for strikes, um you know what maybe he can mix it up maybe he's been too uh, sinker uh, heavy in the zone um when he should be uh throwing some change-ups in the zone or some curveballs in the zone so you know i think this is the type of profile i would buy in a second it's not the profile we were talking about earlier we're finessing a lot of pitches it's a little bit more stuff no command but the it's not Carlos Hernandez, you say Kikuchi, no command. This is like a guy who has a, a either average command or slightly below average command and great stuff. So it's still a, it's still something I would bet on. It's obviously something the Brewers are betting on. There's no real, uh, you know, trend in his numbers over the course of the season. Uh, and uh, I'm buying. One more name to throw at you here, another younger pitcher, one that I think back in early May you might have discussed as a available deep mixed league pitcher that should figure it out, and he really hasn't so far, Daniel Lynch. I mean, are we seeing any signs of adjustments or changes that would change the, the way his season could go once he's back from the IL? He's done with a hand injury right now, so he might have a couple of rehab starts before he rejoins the Royals, but the, the overall numbers from the model don't look good. And the overall numbers just in terms of results don't look good either with a 505 ERA and a 158 whip, despite strikeout per inning results to this point. Yeah. You know, uh, if I was another team, I might, I might consider uh, acquiring him and, and uh, wondering what my uh, pitching coach is going to do with him. One of the one of the really one of the things I liked about him, um, and uh, would be I think uh, interesting to his his next um, his next pitching coach is that he just has so many different pitches, right? Uh, and he's he's demonstrated some ability to 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 shape those pitches and and place those pitches, decent command uh, of the slider and the fastball. He just has poor shapes on all his pitches, and they haven't really gotten better. Uh, he's got a 90, 86 stuff plus on the slider now, and a 91 
on the on the sinker uh, on the um what is it the 91 on the knuckle curve like it's it's um none of his pitches uh now looks that stand out and um i i'm afraid that some of the changes they've made um have made him worse like this year his slider has two inches less vertical movement than it did last year you know and uh somehow is not he's not throwing it much harder uh and it has less horizontal movement so it's just like like what what are you guys doing (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. so uh i would uh, he still is a guy who throws uh fairly hard uh and um i would if i was his future team i would say let's focus on the sinker again let's see if we can get you know the, let's let's shuffle through some of these seam shifted weight grips on this on the sinker see if we can get you plus movement on the sinker, see if we can base this all off the sinker and, and see if your numbers improve. Because remember, all the stuff plus is, is all based off the primary fastball. His four-seam fastball is not very good. What if everything changes when all these other pitches are being based off of his sinker, which is what he was before, what he was when they drafted him? So I, you know, it is one of those things where that there's enough upside there where his team won't want to won't want to trade him. So it may not happen for a while. But I would uh, sit up and take more notice if he was traded, uh, for sure. Yeah, or if they made big changes <laughs> in the pitching development program in Kansas City. I just wonder if there's any way to to pry him loose right now. Because if if you're the Royals, you, you're probably looking at those things and saying, "No, we we've, we've got to get this right. We need Daniel Lynch to be a good starter for us. We have to figure out why as an organization." We don't turn guys like this into more productive starters more often. So if they were to, to trade him away, I mean, I feel like they'd be almost dunking on themselves in, in some ways, mm. right? Yeah, I they, think they'd be more likely they make a pitching coordinator and and a major league pitching coach change before they do that. Yeah, it seems like if, if that doesn't work, then we're talking, you know, a year or two down the road. Then we, we're going down this road with with Daniel Lynch getting an opportunity somewhere else. But but if they do, if they do make a, a pitching coach change, let's say in the off season, I, I'd say that is not impossible. I mean, you know, we're writing pieces about uh, their, their organizational approach, to the fastball, their, you know, his almost historical ineptitude when it comes to the, the starting rotation. Uh, if, if they make a change there and then you hear, you start hearing things about, you know, Lynch is doing this and Lynch is doing that. Um, this is one one place where the model won't help you, right? Because the model is not following him along in the off season, and they might be using elements of Stuff Plus to develop him better, but you won't have access to those numbers. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so those are the times when I I look for a player like Kikuchi. Um, or Ashby, or you know, in this case, Lynch, he's going to be a long shot. The model won't like him, the projections won't like him. But if you do hear stuff like his new pitching coach is getting him back on the sinker and has changed this or changed that, or he's added a tick, like all those things would become meaningful for Lynch because he's demonstrated the ability to throw multiple pitches and he's on the cusp of being a, in a productive big leaguer. That's something that a pitching coach once told me. It was like, my favorite player to get is someone who's triple A to the majors back and forth because I think that they're one thing away. One little tweak. Let's focus on this pitch. Let's do this. They're one little piece away because they've demonstrated that. They've gotten all the way to triple A. They've gotten all the way to the big leagues and they just need one push over the finish line. Um, so any pitcher that is like that is interesting when you're talking about end games, dollar days, you know, long shot, you know, long shot pickups. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think if you're stashing in a deep dynasty league right now, Lynch would still be on that list of, of you just don't want to start him unless you want to be last. <laughs> well, yeah. If you're just, you're just looking to 2023 and you want a chance at someone that could take that step, there's still enough in the profile to, to justify that sort of stash. Had a question come in about uh, model versus results, looking at the pitching plus model. This comes up a lot on the show just as uh, something that we're looking at where we're 
we're surprised that someone is pitching really well because the model doesn't like the characteristics of their pitches. And sometimes we get the, the opposite where someone has great stuff and just isn't getting the results that are expected. So Rob sent us this question. I think it was sent about a reliever, Jacob Barnes, that was out of alignment in terms of model versus results. But I think there's some some broader names here that are, are pretty interesting. And I was starting to look at a few of the starting pitchers that have exceeded expectations this year. Martin Perez, who has some of the worst stuff in the model that you can imagine. I think he's got a 75 stuff plus number. And he's been very good so far. I think most of us know the expectation for him can't be anywhere close to what he did up to this point. But when you're trying to reconcile the differences for someone like Perez, it tends to be good location, bad stuff that allows some starters to, for three, four, maybe even a full season, like three to four months or a full season, could just, it's, it, they can exceed expectations, right? They can get a little bit lucky on balls in play, avoid catastrophic mistakes. Like, is there anything else that you've noticed in the model that leads to these discrepancies that can sometimes, I don't know if they're even fooling us as much as it's just like, it's disappointing us that we can't get it right every time. Yeah. It's just the, I think the, the idea is multiple pitches. That's why I brought up the multiple pitches with Lynch, you know, multiple pitches and above average command, I think can pop at any time. I, I don't think that Paul Blackburn is, you know, really doing anything that's that much different than last year. I'm, I've looked at the numbers. There's like a, a little, a little bit of a tick of velo. Uh, some very slight movement changes, but mostly it's just that a pitcher like Paul Blackburn can become, can throw in a, a stretch like Paul Blackburn just did at any time. And I, one of the things I remember is JT Brubaker's great beginning to his career, really, where here's a guy with a lot of pitches, pretty good command on all those pitches. At some point it, he got figured out and it's not, it's not something that I would bet on long term uh, for uh, Martin Perez, and we've seen him totally fall apart and be left off the playoff roster just last year. So it's not something that I bet on a lot, uh, but I do uh, try to keep a toe in the water with those pitchers. Like, you know, I do have a couple Tyler Anderson shares, for example, for this year, because Tyler Anderson is kind of the patron saint almost of that package of skills don't you think i mean it's yeah like, yeah i think so he's almost like you know if you look at any one of his pitches not that great um who are some other guys i see here tyler anderson uh 25th uh by results and uh one of the uh one of the five pitchers with a sub uh 100 pitching plus um uh, that's in the top 25 you know so, uh, you know, Tyler Anderson belongs exactly what we're talking about. And then if you just scroll a tiny bit down, you get a bunch more. Merrill Kelly. Oh, if there ever was a Tyler Anderson, <laughs> it was Merrill <laughs> Kelly. Uh, Logan Gilbert. A uh, little bit strange, you know, given the velo numbers, but not if you watch him. I think it's just a really good fastball. He can command well. A slider that's not that stuff heavy um, that he can command well. Nestor Cortez. Oh, exactly. This guy. Uh, and usually pitching plus will capture it. So that's the one thing that I think early on when I debuted this model, I think I was very stuff plus. Like I was all about the stuff plus. And, you know, it's great to find a guy like Kyle Wright because he's a 109 stuff plus. Love it. You know, that's going to happen. These guys are going to pop. Spencer Strider, you know, thank you for that very much, model. You know, you, you if you're, if you're watching this, you'll catch all those high stuff guys really early on and, and be a first mover on those guys. But pitching plus comes online a little bit later and it's meaningful, you know? And so you can start to believe what Nestor Cortez is doing uh, after four five, six starts. It takes you a little bit longer. And I think that's a good thing to do because remember JT Brewbreaker. <laughs> um, so, you know, and remember Martin Perez last year. Uh, but some other guys that follow that profile, Carlos Carrasco is now in that profile. He used to have better stuff. But that's who he's now. Ross Stripling, Alex Wood, Alex Cobb to some extent, Pablo Lopez, Chris Bassett, you know, and JT Brubaker himself. Still here. Still here. <laughs> 86 stuff plus 102 command. 
96 pitching plus. And then the last thing is that anybody who can manage a 98 and up pitching plus um, is basically like can be in, in a rotation in big leagues. And anybody who can be in a rotation in big leagues can put together a good stretch. A lot of times I think it means uh, w- who they're up against. That's what I think of a little bit when I see Tony Gonsolin. Now, Tony Gonsolin has actually made some improvements in the model itself because his, his location is better. I think his shoulder is healthier. His command his, at once was god-awful, is, is now average. Um, and even his stuff is now average. So he seems average across the board. But that's my point. Tony Gonsolin, I still think, is pretty much an average Major League starting pitcher. He has put together an amazing stretch. And I think if you kind of play the you know, game log game. Do we need, we need like a, we, we've had different names for this, this, this start, game don't start, game. start, don't start or whatever, you know? Um, I don't know. I see. So he, yes, he's had some good starts at Cincy at uh, Atlanta, but the Cubs, the angels, um, you know, the Mets are kind of a, a there or not there uh, team offensively, Arizona uh, uh, three times in this run. Uh, that helps a lot at Pittsburgh. Um, so, you know, I think uh, to some extent he's been helped by the schedule. Um, and then to some extent he's just been improving his health, his command. You know, for example, he's throwing his splitter now uh, in the zone. It's something he told me at the All-Star game, which I don't think is something he was doing a lot of before. This is the highest zone rate on his uh, splitter that he's had in the big leagues. So there's some approach changes. There's some health changes. So anybody who is anywhere close, like Justin Steele, 94 stuff plus, 98 location, 97 pitching plus, the model doesn't love him, but he's interesting, you know, and if he has the right, if he has the right uh, uh, select uh, group of of opponents in the next few weeks, he could, he can make it work. Thinking about some underperformers with good numbers across the board. Nathan Evaldi coming off of a brutal start against the Blue Jays. I mean, the Toronto offense has been kind of at its uh, expected form <laughs> recently. They've they've really come to life. But Evaldi across the board, stuff number looks good. Location number looks good. Pitching plus number looks good. Results have been brutal. Up to a 430 ERA for the season. The under like the basic peripherals we care about, other than the home run rate, are all very good too. It just seems like some home run issues have really caused his overall struggles this season. But that most recent start, especially, has really pushed those season long numbers out of whack. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think one of the dangers also is that none of this is park adjusted. You know, mm. so uh, I I think of that when I look at Tyler Molly uh, Ma- Mally. Mally. Sorry, that's so hard for me. Nah, there's let's... an A and then there's an H. That's A. Ah. Anyway. Yeah. Mally. Uh, Tyler Mally, uh, 100 stuff, 103 location. He's uh, deceptively sort of part of the kind of Tyler Anderson situation where he's had multiple pitches over his career and he's, and he's, he's tweaked them, but he's always had good command. Um, and by this, it says he's a 104 uh, pitching plus should be good. Four four eight ERA, three three one X ERA, three seven nine FIP. I think it's the ballpark, man. I think the ballpark just doesn't do him any favors. It just does not allow him to kind of get on a good stretch. Um, but uh, there's also uh, an element of you know some of these guys that are down there, lower down that have good model numbers are smaller uh smaller samples like woodruff uh it, you know is way low for for what his what the model says he should be doing um and he has uh many fewer innings than most of his uh compatriots yeah yeah we talked about woodruff i think when he got healthy and it was just like well if you can go trade for him you're getting a, a still elite pitcher based on everything we're seeing in the model And the results just haven't been there yet. He has pitched really well since coming off of the IL. So far, so good as he's been able to manage the Renaud's syndrome that he was dealing with at the end of that IL stint as well. Um, Evaldi, I think, is also interesting, though, because the Red Sox are sliding to the point where they're one bad week away from possibly trading players away. 
I mean, they've got a couple injuries piling up now. Devers just went on the IL. So Evaldi could become a nice trade chip at the deadline for the Red Sox if they want to make him one of the, I think, above average starting pitchers that you could go out and actually acquire. They still have a 26% chance of making the playoffs, according to fan graphs. But, I mean, the next one up from them is the Guardians, who have two wins on them and a 31%. And both of those guys would be out of the playoffs right now, right? Mm -hmm. So the next one up is the... Mariners who would be in, they have a 62%. So that's a big, pretty big drop. And if you if you're just looking around, you're the Red Sox and you're like, you know, us are the Guardians, and what's their schedule gonna look like? Who are they gonna play? Are they gonna play a bunch of Royals and Tigers when we have to play the Blue Jays and the Yankees? Uh, and then I think yeah, you can go over to uh, the roster resource uh, payroll thing for the Red Sox and uh, take a look at who they have that's expiring. Uh, in terms of deals that they won't, people they won't have next year. Got JD Martinez, uh, free agent next year. Nathan Evaldi, free agent next year. Christian Vasquez, Enrique Hernandez, uh, and Michael Waka, Rich Hill, Matt Strom. I think it's uh, maybe easier to let, uh, you know, Rich Hill go for, for very little, uh, but it's somebody like JD Martinez or Nathan Evaldi that might actually get you. Um, a prospect of note. Yeah, I just it's one of those scenarios. I had not thought much about it until recently, but now with the injuries piling up and current state of things, it might make some sense for them to flip a few players that are not going to be around next season. They're going to our, be very active in the free agency market next year. Have to be, right? They have 107 million under contract next year. Yeah, so they'll there'll be something of interest. I there. bet you they extend Xander. They did say extend Xander. Well, he's got an opt out. Oh, I bet you they, I bet you they shore that up. I was like, why are people talking about sign? But the Cubs, everyone signing the Cubs are going to sign him. So it's very interesting. Everyone's assuming that Carlos Correa opts out and goes back into free agency. So he could be an option. Maybe they just switch. Yeah. Maybe they just switch Xander to Correa. That'd be amazing to have Correa story up the middle. Let's get to our prospect of the week segment. I'm going to go uh, against the grain and I'm going to recommend a player who had season ending knee surgery just over a oh, month ago. Really? That's exciting. <laughs> really great, great player to feature DVR way to, yeah. way to dig deep. Uh, this is a stash play. This is a, uh, this is a guy that you want to consider picking up in your deep dynasty or keeper leagues because you're obviously playing for the long-term future. Anyway, you, you would be, even if this player were healthy right now, it's Emmanuel Rodriguez, an outfielder in the Twins organization. Uh, shows power, shows speed. Was walking more than he was striking out this season. 57 walks against 52 Ks as a 19-year-old at Fort Myers. He had a 272, 492, 551 line in 47 games at the time that he got hurt. And I think there was a, a pretty good underlying number in terms of the hard hit rate, too. He was making a lot of hard contact at high A. Rotowire's got some hard hit data on their player pages for minor leaguers. And this is just one of those profiles that I think because the season was cut short, we didn't get that next bit of information. We didn't get to see if the K rate would come down a little bit. We didn't get to see if he'd get a promotion to up another level to see how he'd perform against more advanced competition. And I think there's enough here tools wise to that. If you're in a league where 200 prospects are rostered, I think Rodriguez should be, one of those 200 players that are rostered. That's a, that's a great pull. Although I get to wait around for the, <laughs> the recovery on that one. Um, here's one that will possibly poop or get off the potty quicker. Uh, he's 24 and in triple a already. And he plays for a team that I think still has a need at his position, even though they've been cycling through first baseman. His name is Matt Mervis on the Chicago Cubs. And I know his name, thanks to uh, James Anderson from Rotowire, who co-manages the team with me uh, and picked him up today. <laughs> Walked you, right James into that Anderson. one. <laughs> At least I gave him credit, right? I could have just pretended that was mine. <laughs> uh, but this is amazing now that I'm looking at it. Here's a guy with the Fangraphs gave a 40 hit tool. However, 
uh, he had a 20% strikeout rate in double A this year. So even if it maybe jumps up in the major leagues, he's had other uh, strikeout, higher strikeout rates than minors. I think it's a possibility this guy will strike out less than 25% at, uh, of the time in, in uh, the major leagues. And the other thing that's interesting is he's had a major swing change. He used to hit many ground balls, and then this year he has flipped it basically from 50% ground, ground balls to 50% fly balls. And I know that's a number that scares people. However, he's managed to hit 300 and 350 at high A and double A this year uh, with that profile. Uh, I think it's a pretty intriguing profile. Um, and I would say that I think the Cubs' current selection of first baseman leaves you wanting. Uh, Rivas is interesting but does not have the power you normally expect from a first baseman. And there are no underlying numbers that say he should have it. The max exit velocity is bad. The barrel rate is bad. Uh, he's just, and in the past he's made contact, but he's not making contact. Schwindel is like 30. Uh, so I, you know, I think there's a, there's an opportunity here for maybe they, uh, maybe they release Schwindel. I mean, like, like, I don't. I'm not calling for that, but Schindel has, you know, been released before and been picked up by other teams, and he's almost a full win under replacement this year. And there's not a lot going for him other than his strikeout rate, which is good. You know, maybe they're just like, hey, we need to look to next year, and this 23 year old that's tearing up the minor leagues uh, is a little bit more interesting. 24 year old is a little bit more interesting to us. Yeah, Matt Mervis, M-E-R-V-I-S, if you're looking for him on uh, any league site that you're playing on. Interesting name if they do want to give him a look. So a good selection. Hat tip to James for uh, putting that one on the <laughs> radar for you. Uh, one prospect question before we go. This came in via email from Jody. Which prospect would you rather have between Daniel Espino in the Guardians organization or Kyle Harrison? Can have my choice in a trade and not sure who I want to get out of the two so curious how you would decide between those two if that was a, a problem you were looking at yeah and i gave her a total king of waffles answer and i i you know i'm gonna try and i'm gonna try and be better <laughs> i just explained to her that i thought that uh, daniel espino had the better breaking ball and kyle harrison had the better fastball um and i don't think i made a a, a very uh I don't think I made a decision for her. I just sort of told her those two things. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with the breaking ball guy. I think I'm going to take Daniel Espino. I think there's a chance he has a very special breaking ball. And I I know fastballs are important, but I, I think this is a breaking ball league. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the breaking ball. I'm going to take Daniel Espino. Yeah, I think for me, I lean pretty heavily on, on people like James for decisions like this too. He's got Espino ahead of Harrison. I think part of it for me is also with Espino, I think it's even more polished. Like there's, there's both of these guys are, are high ceiling players, but I think Espino has a safer floor. I think that's the, the difference for me. Like both could be frontline type starters in the long run, but Espino just continues to put up video game numbers. I'm disappointed that because of injuries, we've seen so little of him this year. I think there's a good chance Espino ends up in the fall league just to make up ground innings wise, which is pretty exciting for us. That'd be fun. We'd like to see him there. That would be very good. So edge to Espino for me, it's, it's really just a little more confidence in the floor, but both very good pitching prospects and hopefully not that far away from contributing yeah, now that Meyer's up, you know, there's Ronzi. Uh, Ronzi's down, I guess. Patino, Ronzi, Contreras, Patino, Luis Patino. Um, the I guess the two guys in Baltimore, um, in DL Hall and who's the number Grayson one Rodriguez. Grayson Rodriguez. I, I think that Harrison and Espino belong in that group and uh, near the top, and you know, DL Hall's probably near the bottom, and. I guess Patino is near the bottom of that group, but those are those are my favorite pitching prospects in baseball right now. I think if you said you could have any current prospect in baseball via trade or you're drafting from scratch, Yuri Perez would probably be number one for me. Hmm. Let's throw him in that mix. I mean, six eight, four pitches with command at 19 years old. 
Mm. Sky's the limit. So I, I've, I've kind of, I've elevated Perez even one notch above where, where our friends that uh, handle the prospect rankings have him. That's that's the guy. That's All the guy in. I want. All in. I am in the Yuri Perez fan club now. It didn't take much. Took ten pitches in the futures game, and I was like, yep. <laughs> sign me up. Send me the membership card. I am. That's when in. I fell in love with Shane Boz. So I don't. I don't I'm not holding that against you. Oh, I guess he's. I don't know what he what he counts as. Mm, technically, still a prospect. I think still has eligibility because don't of all the missed time. But sprained UCL, that. so yeah, it's not good. Could be a Tommy John situation. Unfortunately, we'll see if we get some more information on Boz here in the next few weeks. Before we go, I will let everyone know you can get a subscription to The Athletic for just a dollar a month at theathletic.com slash rates in barrels. You know, did you say you get some new ranks coming out in the relative near future? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll do them this week. Thursday or Friday, pitching ranks. Very nice. So be sure to get that. Quote, unquote, in. second half. Second, third. Final third. Third period. <laughs> it's a, it's the fantasy baseball season is just like a hockey game. On Twitter, you can find Eno at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. You can always ask us questions via email, rates and barrels at theathletic.com, or be sure to drop a comment on this video on YouTube. If you're not watching our YouTube channel already, be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if you're listening to us on a platform that allows you to rate and review the podcast, like Spotify or Apple Podcasts, we'd greatly appreciate it if you took the time to do that. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Thursday. Thanks for listening.